you start to be a little bit tired uh, because the, the week was long and, and intense. And you had an exam also this morning, <laughs> which was not uh, expected. And uh, so um, we can start with the second and zone tutorial. Um, so the goal of the second and zone tutorial is on molecular dynamics. Uh, I would like to give you a very sort of short flavor of what one can do to set up the molecular dynamics simulations. And what are the questions that one can and tackle using molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, I realized that the difference in complexity and biological interest between the molecule that I'm showing today and what you're dealing with is enormous, is huge. Uh, but I think it's still useful to study these kind of small systems. And for me, it's an opportunity because you will run actually molecular dynamic simulations on those computers, uh, which are not the Ferrari um, worth, world. Uh, but you can still do it uh, with such a small system. And I will try to explain you why this very simple molecule, which we call the alanine peptide, is interesting. So uh, to start, uh, you should do as we did this morning, so uh, anonymous connection, and then you should copy the link of the second uh, page, and then open the page. So I will do it on my side as well. Okay, so that's how the page looks like. So everyone is on the page. Yeah. So that's how the page looks like. So you have uh, a very short summary of what we're going to do that you can read uh, later on. Then what I'm also presenting is the software that we're going to use. Um, and so basically what you will see here, so first of all, uh, we're going to run simulations using Gromax. So Gromax is... Uh, a popular software for running molecular dynamic simulations. I don't know if you've used already, David, for sure. Um, and well, I will tell you something about Gromax because I think it's important later on, but that's the, the program we're gonna use. And so we will set up simulations, we'll run simulations. You will run simulations. I obviously I simplify your life. Um, and the idea is basically, I produce macro commands, so similar to what uh, Gilles Marcou showed this morning. So it looks trivial because you click on one button, start, you get the results, and then you analyze the results. That's not real life. You can ask David, it's not real life. That's why he's automatizing all the processes in order actually to avoid all the, the troublesome and the barriers. Uh, but there's a full theory based on statistical mechanics beyond simulations that one needs to understand to some extent. Uh, and I'm sure also Martin knows it very well. Um, and that's important in order to understand how to set up your simulation. So most of the time you have an input file, you have to fill this input file with numbers and keywords. And if you don't know what to do, your simulation can be completely useless. So as I tend to say all the time to my students, it's very easy run a molecular dynamic simulation. It's very hard to run a meaningful molecular dynamic simulation. So there's a lot of understanding beyond that is hidden in this tutorial, but I gave you also the opportunity to dig into the details if you're interested, if you're fast, because actually the audience is very heterogeneous. So that's one of the problems of these uh, tutorials, but uh, it worked very well this morning. So I'm sure it will work also this afternoon. There's the extra complexity of the lunch. So that's, uh, Nothing special. Yeah, so uh, the other thing is we're going to use VMD that maybe some of you know. Uh, so VMD is visual, visual Molecular Dynamics. That's a very popular program for visualizing uh, proteins, uh, Molecular Dynamics simulations, doing analysis uh, developed at Urbana Champagne. So that's the NMD community, which is another program for running MD simulations. Uh, but VMD is sufficiently um, flexible that you can actually upload simulations from Gromax, from Charm, from NAMD, from Amber, and visualize them. So DMD is uh, 
a very useful program in general for visualizing structures and dynamics. Then there will be some GNU plot. GNU plot is just a way of plotting things under the Linux environment. All this works under Linux. So if you don't know how to use Linux, then it's a little bit of a problem, but uh, you have this uh, file here. So maybe I have to wear glasses, otherwise I'm useless. Mm -hmm. So you see this uh, file is called MD lab Linux command. So um, most of us as modelers, they uh, work under the command line environment. So we open a shell, we type commands on the command line, we execute commands, and then we look at the outputs and we process the output. Uh, that, that was uh, the Linux way of working. Uh, long time ago. Then Linux is evolving and you can still go icons by icons. I've seen some of you this morning doing it. So clicking on a, on files. So, and so the gap between Windows, Mac OS X and Linux becomes smaller now, but it is, it is still very useful to know how to run command lines, particularly if you want to pack series of commands in one script. That is a macro command that run all the commands in the same at the same time and one after the other. So most of the time what we do is we optimize series of commands, we put in a macro command, and then we have this macro command, we run this macro command that does almost everything for us. So that, that is what I prepared for you in different places of the tutorial. So you'll be able to run this macro command, and but then you can open the file. So I did the file and see what are the individual commands that are inside the macro commands. Um, okay, so uh, let me see what is the structure of the file. So we have end out. So the end out is uh, what you're supposed to do, uh, it, which is described in details. Then you have the introduction that is what I'm going to show in a minute. So that's uh, the background uh, where I'm supposed to foster the motivation for doing this tutorial and with some explanations. And then you have also some technical files. So the Linux command file that allows you to have a description of basic commands that we use, like how to change a directory command line, how to go back, how to list the content of the directory, how to know where, where you are, so it is the printing directory. Um, all this looks like a language. So if you find yourself in China, you don't know how to speak Chinese, very little communication. So that's how most of my students feel with the computers. So we don't speak the same language, so it's difficult to use at the beginning. And so, yeah, so we thought it was a good idea to have this uh, resume of main commands uh, so that I don't spend 90% of the tutorial saying, mm -hmm. CD is for changing the directory. <laughs> it's, it's also helps me. And then there's another technical file that is uh, uh, basically a way of uh, sketching a molecule using Marvin. So Marvin is like a Maxon tool and maybe some of you knows it already. And basically, you can sketch a molecule, you can draw it, and you can download the molecule in various different formats. So what we're, we're interested in is a PDB. I will show you an example. So Marvin is part of the tutorial. So originally, it was not part of the tutorial. Uh, the program I used years ago was Avogadro, which was a very nice uh, molecular visualizer where you could also optimize structures live. And so even if you're drawing a benzene that was not a perfect hexagon, mm -hmm. Uh, through MM simulations uh, and energy minimization, Avogadro would put you in a perfect uh, uh, geometry, so perfect uh, regular hexagon. So it was very visual, but unfortunately, the second, the new version of Avogadro is not working at all and is not maintained. So I had to change uh, uh, the way of uh, uh, doing it. Okay, so. Um, no, not the handouts. So what I want to show is uh, actually the introduction. And you have the slides over there, so maybe I, I can actually... Uh, science, uh, kitchen. I think nothing will change. I will show it from here. Uh, 
you can also put this one. No. Look, this the first the first one, the first button, or this one? Doesn't matter. Or you want to, to see me? If you want to see if it's how we want. If you want to show or we can just try with them. I don't know. <laughs> I feel shy. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is the title of this uh, tutorial? So the tutorial uh, is entitled Conformational Analysis of a Mini Protein in Solution. So actually, I'm, I'm hiding this off. Yeah. Of a Mini Protein in Solution. So what is the subject of this tutorial is this molecule here. So we call it Mini Protein. It's maybe far-fetched. <laughs> hmm? But a few years ago, uh, mini protein was a common name to say what I'm doing is biomolecules. Although I'm studying an organic compound, but it's biomolecules. So it's relevant for biomolecules. And so you could increase your impact of your publication. Mm -hmm. And so particularly if you're coming from ecological development, as I was discussing with Martin this, this uh, during lunch, most of the studies where people develop new methodologies are applied on the RNA peptide. So there must be something interesting in this molecule, and you're gonna discover why is, is it so interesting. Because I am sure that from your point of view, it looks uninteresting now. If you consider SHIP, two proteins, if you consider GPCRs, if you consider ligand gate ion channels, that's not the same complexity. But still this molecule is complex enough that is interesting. Okay, so what is the goal of the tutorial? So the goal is exploring the conformational dynamics of this molecule because that's interesting for uh, understanding how proteins actually work in general. And so that's somewhat is, uh, again, is not so clear from this title slide. I'll try to make it clear. But even before starting, what I want to um, tell from the beginning is why do we use molecular dynamics in the first place? I mean, some of you may think that we use molecular dynamics to see molecular movies. Because molecular dynamics gives you a trajectory. So you can follow the evolution of molecules over time. So it looks like a movie. So it's a Netflix version of science. And actually, that's not the principal aim of molecular dynamics. It's not the reason why molecular dynamics was invented, developed, and further used. So molecular dynamic simulations is a way of sampling. So we use MD simulations, which is solving the Newton's equations of motion for a molecular system and evolving it over time to sample configurations of our molecular systems. So configurations, just to clarify in terms of statistical mechanics, if you know the 3D coordinates of all the atoms of your system, you have a single configuration. So a configuration is a vector of coordinates, which span 3N coordinates, where the n is the number of atoms that you have. So once you know x, y, z for all the atoms, you have a single configuration of your system. Now, why this is interesting? Why do you think it's interesting? So the Netflix stuff was more interesting, right? So watching movies. So why do we need to sample configurations? Well, energy difference is, uh, uh, is not correct, because energy, uh, if you have coordinates, you, you need an energy model, and then you can compute an energy. So you can associate, what is true, you can associate to each configuration one energy value. And then if you have two different configurations, I can evaluate the energy of these two configurations and see whether one configuration is lower in energy than the other. Well, like interaction with the protein is also- That's also related to energy. Yes, we can evaluate interactions in the limit of the energy model. But what, yeah? I mean, the coordinates in the means you can calculate different properties of the molecule? You can calculate different properties, so but the properties will be dependent on the configuration. So like energy, energy is uh, depends on the coordinates that you have. So if you have configuration one, two, three, four, you can have different energies. But the reason why we do so is because we want to evaluate probabilities. So if we sample configurations and we make statistics over those configurations, we can evaluate probabilities. Now, if my molecule is benzene, hmm?
So this molecule benzene in vacuum, okay? So this molecule is extremely boring because benzene will stay as an hexagon, sort of perfect hexagon all the time. And so you will have vibrations around the equilibrium position. So bond lengths will change as harmonic springs, the same distances between carbon atoms, but nothing really changes. Now, let me see if I make these modifications. What is this? This is the polarity. How do we call this molecule? Cyclohexane. So why this one? So this is boring. <laughs> this is interesting. Why this is interesting? Because it actually can stay in the bot configuration, the chair configuration. So it's dancing. This molecule is dancing. <laughs> this one is not. And so this molecule is dancing, so it means that you have multiple states, at least two. So one is... Uh, that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> Actually, this one is like this. I'm just simplifying. So that's the both configuration. That's the chair configuration of cyclohexane. So now you can see molecular movies because you can see that the molecule stays a little bit in the boat, then it goes over the barrier. So it's interesting to know what is this configuration on top of the barrier. Then it goes down to the chair, it stays a little bit, and then it goes back and forth. And so if it goes back and forth, we can evaluate probabilities because we can actually count the number of, of time of frames that we have in one configuration over the number of total frames that we have sampled. Let me write it differently. So N I, and that's a probability. And then through probabilities, statistical mechanics tells me that I go to three images. So what we measure experimentally is also probabilities, but probabilities, so, I wanted to have a better mark marker. So a different scene free energy, delta Fij between two configurations is Fj minus Fi. So if we go to statistical mechanics, statistical mechanics tells me that the free energy is proportional to the logarithm of the partition function. Now complicated terms to say something easy. And the partition function is the number of states or the number of configuration which correspond to a macro state of the system. So the free energy of the both configuration is how many configurations are, so it's proportional to how many configuration we have in this configuration here, in this stadium. And now if I do Fj minus Fi, so this delta F, it sucks. is minus kbt, the logarithm of zj over zi, okay? Which I, I can rewrite as minus kbt, logarithm of zj over z total, plus kbt, that I over Z total. So it's simple mathematical uh, derivations, but this ratio here is how many configurations I have in state I over the total number of configurations I have. So the partition function is the number of states. If we think of the microcanonical ensemble is really number of states. If you go to the canonical ensemble is number of states weighted by the energy because not all the states have got the same energy. So lower energy states, they weight more than high energy states. But it's the, the effective number of states that you have in one configuration over the total. So that's really a probability. So it's similar to this, right? Number of frames over the number of total frames 
that's number of effective states over the total number of, of effective states. So that's a probability. So this delta Fij is equal to minus Kbt the logarithm of Pj over Pi. So if I have a ratio of probabilities, if I know how to measure probability, that corresponds to a difference in free energy. So you can easily see that if the difference in free energy is zero, the log of something is zero, so this is one. So same probabilities, but the same free energies. If one of the two has got a lower free energy, so this ratio becomes either large or small. And then you change, you change the population. So you have minority of one configuration over the others. So we use molecular dynamic simulations in some cases or where we're lucky so that we can sample reversibly all the states to do actually free energy calculations. And these free energy calculations can be compared with experiments. So what we want to do in here is actually sampling how many configurations of the iron peptide will have in one state or in the second state or in the third state or the fourth state because this system is simple enough that we can actually have transitions between the multiple states, conformational state of the molecule. If we go to ligand ion channels, you will not see the spontaneous transformation between the closed state to the open state. You will not see activation in molecular dynamics unless you do something special. And this something special that we have seen from Eric Lindali's Markov state modeling, where we drag the system from one to the other, and then you try to reconstruct all the pathing or to make it meaningful. Or you do metadynamics, as Martha was um, uh, describing it. So if we don't see, if you do one microsecond simulation and you stay here, uh, there's nothing you can learn. You have to push the system out of this barrier and then reversibly back and forth. And so that's why people invented an unsampling, because actually this works only for a system like this one. Okay. All right. So that's what we're going to do. The second thing we're going to do that is clear from here, which is, I think, a beautiful picture. The island peptide is not in vacuum, it's in solution. So we will have to consider all the water molecules around the island peptide. And so what you will be doing is not vacuum simulation, or not only vacuum simulation. You'll do vacuum simulation as well. But you will do the conformation analysis in vacuum, then you will add the solvents, and then you'll do the simulation in, simu in solution. And ready, so you will learn how to construct a water box, how to put the molecule inside the water box, thermalize everything, running the, the dynamics. If you have questions, don't hesitate, right? So question number one, so why the dipeptide? So I think one motivation that is clear from my introduction is it's simple enough. And it's interesting enough. It's simple, we can run simulation, it's interesting because it's complex, so multiple states, and we can actually sample trajectories going from one state to another one, so spontaneous transitions. Now, why it is biologically relevant? That, that's something I didn't say. So it's still a big question mark. So because the alanine dipeptide, so what is the alanine dipeptide, first of all? So the alanine dipeptide is, uh, if you think in the middle here is one alanine residue, and then you take this alanine residues, you cap this alanine residues with an acetyl group at the end terminus and with the amide group, methyl amide group at the C terminus. So it's one alanine residue capped with an acetyl and uh, a methyl amide. So why this is interesting? Because actually by doing this capping, well, first of all, you remove formal charges. So there's no plus or minus. Mm -hmm. And the second, you have a nice model of the backbone of the protein. That's a nice model of the background of the protein. And so you have these two dihedral angles, so phi and psi, which are typically used to construct the Ramachandran plot that I'm sure you're aware of, where we can see how proteins actually uh, project over this Ramachandran plot to see how many alpha helices we have, how many beta sheets we have, so how many secondary structural elements. Because the conformational dynamics of this uh, model system here is able to produce conformations which are alpha-like, alpha helical like or beta-sheet-like. So 
the emergence of these secondary structures in proteins, beta sheets and alpha helical configurations, is a consequence of the fact that the backbone of the protein has got this flexibility. If you didn't have this flexibility, you couldn't create beta sheets and alpha helical structures. So what we want to uh, sort of infer is, or say, to touch with our hands, with simulations here, is the dogma of molecular biology. That is, you've given a given sequence, you the sequence of the protein codes for a given structure, which correspond to a function. So the passage from sequence to structure depends on this conformational dynamics, because it depends on how this conformational dynamics translates into secondary structural element and how the secondary structural elements, they are disposed in space, which provides the tertiary structure of the protein. And this tertiary structure of the protein is already functional because if you consider monomeric enzymes in solutions, they're able to catalyze reactions already. Now, if you wanna go beyond function, you know what is beyond function? Regulation. So if you want to go beyond function, you want to regulate function, then you need to go to quaternary architectures. I mean, you may have regulation also in monomeric proteins, but generally is in multi-domain proteins because you have interfaces between domains and you want to actually act on these low frequency motions. But the best nature has invented, which is allosteric proteins for regulation, is so emerges in quaternary architectures. So when you have to move monomers, which are rigid like uh, structures, one relative to the other. And what is interesting to understand is if you have a monomer like this one, so if you compute the normal modes of this uh, object, so there will be a given number of normal modes, but the, the first six modes that we call zero frequency modes are translations and rotations. So I can translate my molecule in vacuum without no change in energy, same rotations. If I have two objects like this and I make a dimer, so this translation becomes actually not free anymore because if I move these two molecules, the, the energy changes because they're they are interacting. But that's a low frequency mode, so a very easy to change property of the molecule that is transformed in a slightly more difficult, but still easy. It's much easier to change this relative orientation of these two objects or position than changing internally. The structure of the protein. So here you need less energy. And there you can have molecules that bind and change the configuration. So let's imagine that we do this movement here. I bind a molecule and then I stop. Or I bind an antagonist and I go on the other side. So function, regulation. I mean, I'm selling many things and we are still with the alien data type, which is nothing like. So, but how can we, so it's very important to understand this conformational dynamics and how this conformational dynamics translates into structures and so tertiary structure and eventually also quaternary structures. So how do we do so? Well, we have to follow basically these two dihedral angles, phi and psi. Those are not the only degrees of freedom of this molecule that is still small, but complex, but those are the soft, softest degrees of freedom of the molecule. So if you want to change distances between atoms along bond lengths, it costs much more energy than changing the dihedrals. So the dihedral is the easiest way of changing the internal conformation of biomolecules. And so that's why large amplitude conformational transitions, like those that are observed here, so from beta sheet-like configuration to alpha helical-like configurations, they occur through torsional transitions, so dihedral transitions. Now, uh, how can we actually uh, monitor this conformational dynamics? Uh, we can evaluate these dihedral angles, so that's one of your tasks. So you will have to produce structures, measure this torsional degrees of freedom using DMD, and then we'll do simulations, and then you'll measure how these um, angles change over time, and so we can follow the dynamics of the molecule. And actually this, that's relevant because uh, uh, if you take the full uh, protein data bank and you project the full protein data bank over this Ramachandran plot, what you observe here is that not all of them is accessible. There's only a tiny fraction of the Ramachandran plot that is accessible. So all this white region here is not accessible. So we can identify 
three states essentially. So one that is up here, which is good for beta sheets configuration. So parallel, anti-parallel beta sheets or beta sheets, right twisted beta sheets. This region here, which is right-handed alpha helical configurations. And this region here, which is less populated, which is left-handed alpha helical. So we have two secondary structure, beta sheets and alpha helical configurations. And we have a distinction between right-handed and left-handed. Now, question for the audience. So why do we have a left-handed alpha helical configuration and why the population here is so tiny? Less stable than the right-handed. It is less stable for what reason? Interaction between... No, 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 you <laughs> Energy. Yeah, but why? So first of all, uh, you see, beta sheets are only right twisted. There's no left twisted beta sheets. For helices, we have right-handed and left-handed. So this is already something that is asymmetric. Now, the second information that I want to give, this is proteins, natural proteins projected on Ramachandran plot. So you know that amino acids are chiral and we have only L amino acids naturally expressed. The amino acids are synthetically expressed but not naturally expressed. So amino acids are chiral. So chiral amino acids are supposed to produce chiral structures when they put together. And the fact that you have only the right twisted beta sheet is a chiral representation of this molecular chirality. Now, why do we have both right-handed and left-handed illicits? Bacteria, um, amino acid, B, B. No, no, all of these amino acids are L. There's no D amino acid in it. Okay, then it's, it's, it should be the same reason for the DNA stability, right? Like uh, this, right? Yeah, this for, for this, like the interaction between second, between different parts, secondary, let's say, tertiary structure. I didn't send your, uh, Response. So why do we do we see something here? I think interaction between different chains and uh, this can stabilize one particular. So in, through interactions, essentially. Other possibilities? Maybe there is like each strain in the protein. Then that's what he's mentioning, essentially interactions. So interaction that put strain energy, and so the molecule adopts a different configurations. Other proposals? And this present. Yeah, Nina. The same. Um, present of glycine trying to. Great. Why glycine? Mm -hmm. Because it's not chiral. I also want to say. That's too easy. I think this is actually from the same one that we have taken this. Glycine is not chiral. And so what you observe here is just glycines. Mm -hmm. So naturally occurring glycines, they can stay both in R and L, which is understandable because it's not chiral. All right, so bottom line, phi and psi angles are very important for protein structure, function, and regulation. So it's worth understanding them from a modeling point of view. Now, how do we measure them? Well, that's my practical recipe. So you have actually, you have to evaluate angles between planes. So when you have a polypeptide chain, so you know that the polypeptide bond, so the peptide bond is planar. So you see uh, the nitrogen, the carbonyl carbon, and the carbonyl, carbonyl oxygen, and the C alpha, they are on the same plane. So if I go to the second amino acid, I have the same thing. So the C alpha, the um, N, the carbonyl oxygen, so the amide, the amide nitrogen, the carbonyl oxygen, oxygen, they are on the same plane. So there are, there are two planes. So we need to compute angles between these two planes. And how do we compute angles between two planes? Normally we compute vectors. So vectors orthogonal to the planes. So if I have one plane, one vector orthogonal, another plane, one vector orthogonal, I have two vectors, I compute a scalar product. I don't know if you still remind this. <laughs> I could be the scalar product, and from the cosinus of the angles, taking the arc of cosinus of the angle, I can compute an angle. You will not do it. VMD will do it for you. But you need to specify what are the angles that you want to compute. So what are the recipes? So if you look at here, 
there are actually three the hydrolangles in a in a peptide chain. So there's phi, psi, and omega. Omega is the one that is the most boring because actually in most cases, so the amide NH and the carbonyl CO, they point in different directions. So this is 180 degrees. Only if you really strain this bond, they can go to cis and so they can go to zero, but most of the time they stay in trans. Now, what we can change is phi and psi. So phi is a torsional angle. A torsional angle, to define a torsional angle, you need four atoms. And that corresponds to a rotation around this bond here. So in order to identify this angle, you need to, to, produce, to, to pick up one atom here, one atom here, the third atom here, and the fourth atom here. So one atom before the bond and one atom after the bond, including the two in the middle. So if you select these four atoms and you compute the dihedral angle, then you compute phi. Psi is the rotation around the second covalent bond, next phi. So in this case, you will start from the nitrogen, amidic nitrogen of your amino acid, C alpha, carbonyl, carbonyl carbon of this amino acid, plus the nitrogen of the N plus one. So the amino acid that follows. So since we have one, two, three atoms, backbone atoms in one amino acid, you need to go one atom before to compute phi and one atom later to compute psi. So this picture here, you will be using all the time because when you will have your Allende peptide and you want to monitor the angles, you have to pick up the atoms. So I suggest with DMD, you will try to reorient the molecule as it is depicted here, and then you will know exactly which atom to pick. So what you're gonna do is simulating the Allende peptide and monitoring in structures and simulations, these phi and psi angles. And then we'll try to draw considerations about how actually temperature modifies these angles. So what are the possible states of the molecule and how the solvent modifies these angles. So what is the agenda for today? The agenda is, uh, first of all, we want to model the Allende peptide starting from its chemical structures. So most of you are chemists, you know how to draw molecules, that's easy. So we will use Martin sketch for doing this and then we will extract coordinates. You will have PDB and then you will start your simulation from those. We have to optimize the geometry in a vacuum. Then we have to explore the conformational dynamics in a vacuum and in solution by molecular dynamics. So we will set up MD simulations and then we, we, we will analyze the dynamics of very long trajectories that I have run for you. So you will have to analyze those trajectories and you will have converged results on the possible states. Are there questions on this? Now we're gonna use Gromax. So I wanna spend one minute more uh, discussing about Gromax uh, because I think it's a very interesting project. Uh, so first of all, Gromax, so why Gromax? Gromax is by far the fastest engine for molecular dynamic simulations. So from a technical point of view is the best you can have uh, in the world. So it's worth using it because it's fast, it's well-written, it exploits optimally your computer resources. So you don't have to specify how it should work, but you will understand by himself what you have on your computer and how to optimize the resources. So that, that was a big effort from the community in Sweden led by Erik Lindahl, that was our guest uh, uh, on Tuesday. And so he's leading this community. And I don't part, I'm not part of this community, so I'm not making any commercial for them. I don't get money from Gromax, you know. Uh, so it, it is worth using it. Uh, the second thing is a European project. So we have many different projects like Charm, like Amber, like AMD, they're not European. So I sort of feel as a European person, and I think we should actually promote also our research and not only think that just Americans are able to do research, right? Now, the second thing, uh, the third thing is, uh, what is quite impressive is, uh, so that's a project that involved so many people and so much time that one has to quantify what is the cost of the development of this project. And so that's an old slide, by the way, so in 2018, 
So it was estimated that 495 persons years were invested in this project for the development. With this 1,800,000 code base lines. And if you consider an average salary of $50,000, $55,000 per year, so this corresponds to a $30 million product. And that's for free. So you can download in your computer. There's no need for license. You can actually use it. There's a community that is maintaining it. Uh, there are people that produce tutorials. Uh, that you can actually explore and you can learn yourself uh, and nothing is demanded. So you basically have a Ferrari under your seat for free. So profit. Good job. Okay, so I'm going to explain uh, very quickly. So I'm going to show you what we are supposed to do. So how it works, then I let you work because actually this morning didn't have a lot of time. So if you look at the handouts, this handout should be sort of self-explanatory. Now, there are several ways of using these handouts. Uh, the easiest way, if you really want to go fast, essentially, you just have to type these macro commands, which are written in courier uh, font and larger than uh, than everything else. So if you just type these commands, you can finish the tutorial in less than half an hour. But of course, understanding nothing. So that's not the goal, but that's a possibility. Now, in general, when you see black, um, writing so that's information when you see blue writing that's action that's something you should do or where an intervention is required when you see red those are questions so questions for you that requires an answer and it would be good if you can write a short report on this and the short report for me is very simple so if i ask you the values of IMSI, I just want to see the values. I don't want to see 10 lines saying, I did this and this and this and this, and I measured this and then it didn't work. And then I did this and then those are the final values. So IMSI, period. But at least you keep track of what you have done and that's important. Um, now, technically you're almost ready to start. Uh, technically speaking, uh, what you should do is, uh, so I'm moving back to Moodle. What you should do is to click on this link, MDLabTAR. You follow this link that is here. And then you download this file. So that's the archive which contains all the file. So you will download this file. You will open the archive. And then you have all the files that are required in order to do the tutorial. So I will stop here talking. I'm available, obviously, if you have questions, problems. But now it's hands on, so it's uh, your turn. Enjoy. So should I stop here? You can stop the registration, maybe.